<laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Listen, Sal, look, I want to thank you for doing this. Um, as you know, I'm trying to get as many of these done as possible for mm -hmm. the end of this year. Sure. And stuff. Um, you and I were talking about what we were going to talk about because you're a man of many different mm -hmm. activities. You've done a lot since you've been here in Japan. You've been mm -hmm. here for how long now? Uh, basically since 88. 88, right? Yeah. And as we were talking before, let's, well, let's get into you a little bit. So like yeah. your background. You okay. were born you um, were, um, mm -hmm. in, in the U.S., Stanford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I had uh, an older sister, two younger brothers. Um, I joined the Marine Corps um, after university or after college. I went to a uh, technical college, got a mechanical engineering degree, mm -hmm. and then uh, decided, well, you know, I want to do something different, I want more adventure. So I, mm -hmm. I joined the Marine Corps. What year was that? Did you and, join uh, I joined in the, at the end of '86. Okay. Um, when you, was your father in the in the military? Uh, my my uncle was in the military. Okay. Um, he was drafted. Korean and uh, Vietnam War. So you joined in 86. Yeah. So there was nothing going on. We hadn't yeah. done anything. No. Wait, no. Me. no, we hadn't done anything. We yeah. weren't, there was nothing about Iraq. Yeah. We hadn't done that because that happened in 90. Yeah. 1990. Yeah. So what, but what was the drive for you to want to be in the military? Just adventure. I just wanted to get out and see more of the world and experience different things and, okay. you know, be challenged in some, you know, uh, you know, kind of scary, cool way, you know, right. that, that was, you know, kind of what I was thinking. Um, when I got into the into the Marine Corps, I, I ended up in logistics operations as a you know focused job. I got um, what we were called red patchers, and so I did a bit of um, what was called helicopter support teams and rigging, mm -hmm. which is where basically the helicopter, um, a fifty three uh, Echo would fly, or you get on the forty sixes as well, and those are the double. The double double yeah. And um, they'd hang a rope off the bottom and we'd do exercises this way. So we would actually hang from that rope. We'd be clipped on. Mm -hmm. There'd be six of us on this rope and the helicopter would fly around with us dangling off the bottom and then come down and then um, slowly drop each one of us off. We'd have to unclip, roll off, and then you know escape into the woods. And um, it, was a, it was interesting, a lot of fun, dangerous, of course. Because I saw pictures, of the picture on, on your Facebook page mm -hmm. has you and then has you in the background yeah. when you were in the Marines. Yeah. And you looked a lot bigger. I was much bigger. I mean, yeah. wait, how, I mean even almost in height, too. I mean, yeah. I wasn't sure it was you, and I had to look really close. Yeah. Say, That's so. Yeah. So, well, I think maybe it just, you know, because I was just bigger you and were, I was you standing were big. more you were, straight. You were like yeah. this, wow. Yeah, I was probably close to what, at least about 25 pounds heavier than mm -hmm. I am now. Mm -hmm. And of course it was, you know, mostly muscle. You know? Right. I mean, right. I, you know, my body fat content sticks in and around 10. Okay. You know, so. That's almost Olympics. Yeah. yeah. Six is Olympics. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, <sighs> so, you know, when I got, um, you know, through the Marine Corps, um, I did 10 years in total. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, of course the first Gulf War I was in during that time, but um, I was rolling off of active duty and um, but didn't actually go. I got to stay back because there was a lot of stuff going on, and I had the experience for, you know, from a logistics operations perspective to get uh, troops and, and machines and you know equipment and stuff loaded up on ships and, and you know uh, planes and stuff like that mm -hmm. to get over there. So is that how you came uh, to Japan? Is that's how I came to Japan. Yeah. And you're stationed in, in Okinawa? Okinawa. Yeah. Right. So how long were you there? Just see. So no, I was down. I was in Okinawa from uh, well until what ninety nine. Okay. Um, you know, and I had met uh, my wife, my now ex wife, down there, and I had had three kids and now two grandchildren. <laughs> so um, you're a grandpa. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's fun. You know, um, you know, people always you know ask you that question. You know, if you had to do it over again, would you do it different? I don't think so. I mean, um, especially the kid part. Right. You know, um, kids and even grandchildren are, are if, you know, if, if you have some, um, you probably understand, but if you don't, then, uh, you know, when you do have some, hopefully everyone does, um, it's a very different experience than your own children as well. Right. It's just a, um, yeah. I think it's just age, patience, learning to, um, you know, respect yourself, respect people, mm -hmm. um, and seeing that aspect of life that comes together through, you know, everyone goes through their struggles. Name some of the companies you work for once since you've been here. Because um, so you started off here. Because after, yeah. after the Marines, did you go straight back to the States? No, no, I, I've never left. 
I've been here. Oh, you were discharged too. here? Yeah. You took your orders here? You're I did. Well, I, I went back just to get discharged, but it was only a couple months, and then I was... Then Where's I discharged from the Marines? Where did uh, I went to California, to Pendleton. Even outside of the military, I was still attached to the military from a contract perspective, so okay. I was doing some IT work. Um, you know, like I said, I was doing logistics operations, my background being mechanical engineering, and then while I was in, I took advantage of being in the Marine Corps and getting the, the availability to go to school for free. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, if you, as long as you pass the class. Right, of course, but, of course. Yeah. And then the GI Bill, so I you know, went, went back to school and uh, got a degree in psychology and then one in, in social science, basically, which was covered most of the Asian studies and, and some languages and things like that. So, um, but I, I went to work for a company that supports the military and they're you know, mostly IT operations, mm -hmm. networks and things like that. And then uh, I did that for a couple of years and then uh, got pulled up here to work for Merrill Lynch here in Tokyo. And so I was doing information security at that point. Right. Um, jumped around a bit to NTT Communications to earn. That's after. That was after. After Merrill, yeah, Merrill all, Lynch. all here in Tokyo, you know. Kind How of. How long were you with here. Merrill Lynch? Just two years. Two years, right? Yeah. Um, they went through big cutbacks and. Yeah. Right. That's the story you were telling me at lunch. Yeah. 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 That was no fun. Yeah. So, but you know, you wow. just, you know, take the punch and roll, right? But, how did, but how did you handle that? Because tell me the story again. How did yeah. when you were at Merrill Lynch? Mm -hmm. They were going to do these cutbacks, and they took you and how many other people? Out yeah, there happen? were a good uh, maybe 15 of us or so. And you but had no clue? No clue. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, I mean, stuff had started, you know. Okay. The, the whole cutback, the whole, you know, reducing the headcount thing started. Um, but a, a lot of it was focused on the, uh, the Yamaichi Shokan people. Um, you know, that was acquired, Merrill Lynch acquired them a number of years before mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And then they just had to, you know, lighten the load. Um, but you know, my department uh, was uh, heavily engaged or integrated with those areas that um, were associated to being let go. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we were taken out to lunch and then we weren't allowed back in the building. Um, so you, just well, a, how many of you were foreigners? Uh, actually, probably about half of us. There were about eight, eight or nine of us that were foreigners. So what were some of the reactions? I'm just curious. Uh, oh, it was quite interesting because I mean, um, you know, of course, at the time, this was kind of a, a you know, between the bubble and, the, and the, you know, kind of this rolling um, impact from the bubble era going through and then all these problems coming around and what mm -hmm. to do. Um, yeah, people were devastated. I mean, I was just kind of numb. I, I was kind of like, oh, here we go again. But, you know, I mean, uh, for me, I'd been, you know, kind of in and out of work, you know, because it was contract based. And I thought, you know, with Merrill Lynch, you know, Give you the, the the background on Merrill Lynch. I, I went through seventeen interviews to get into Merrill Lynch, okay. and all in the same day. Mm -hmm. I started uh, at six thirty in the morning and didn't finish until midnight. And um, it's quite an interesting, you know, it was quite an interesting story. But I mean, there were a lot of specifics that you had to go through with the people you talked to, um, and it was really them gauging whether you could fit with the environment. You know, mm -hmm. it was are you a Merrill person or not? Mm -hmm. And, um, but all of these companies are, are, you know, a bit delusional from my perspective in how they approach you because um, they're pushing this agenda that, you know, they want you, you know, we, we, you know, we're gauging you. We want to know if you're right to stay with us and then we expect you to be here forever. So you're making the commitment, they're judging you, right? I got you. And, um, you know, so to them, you should feel, you know, so honored, honored to be asked to interview and all this other stuff, but then you're just a number once you get in there. You're just a head count. But, you know, that's what it was, so I just, you know, stepped off and went to the next thing, you know. And right. which course, was, what was that? What was the next thing? The next thing ended up being NTT Communications, which okay. was still in the security realm. Right. Um, and then from there, that was contract, and, and um, after a year there, um, you know, they had their own challenges internally where they just cut all, all kinds of stuff around, changed groups, moved people around, stuff like that. Um, when they were in process of debating what was going on, uh, because I only I knew it was a one-year contract, mm -hmm. I had started looking, and um, I, you know, they, they approached me, and then I had already had something else available, and um, you know, it kind of led into it was a good good situation that I did leave because. Three months later, they disbanded our group and m merged them into other business units. Right. And I went over to Ernst & Young, or Shin Nihon Kansahoji, mm -hmm. is what they mm -hmm. call it in Japanese, 
and um, worked there for a couple of years. Um, that was a, a two-year contract, basically. So everything I was getting into just ended up being contract work, not kind of a, oh, an right official, there. you know, full-time position. And that's um, what you really wanted. You wanted to no, get some. No, no, I was. I, well, I would, yeah, what I really wanted was something full time, full time, something to really be able to establish. Just have some, you know, yeah. You well, your time in there counted. For yeah, something right. right. Yeah, and and for me, it's more about you know, um, sure, it's made me all of these uh, situations where I've been jump, jumping around mm -hmm. and you know going contract to contract here and there has made me very agile. That's for sure. Um, I, I believe that's probably more beneficial to anybody, um, any company who would hire me because mm -hmm. I'm flexible and, and, and I know so much more worldly from the perspective of every business operation, internal, external, right. sales, marketing, you know, the back office, the front office, um, you know, if you break it down simply, but then my, my experience with, you know, telecommunications, IT in general, security, um, all these different areas. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and most of my positions over the past 15 years have been management level positions, right. um, you know, running uh, groups of IT and or mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. um, operations as well. Um, but so that's helped me kind of mold in and understanding and uh, be able to uh, forecast and plan things in and around how to actually build businesses and build a solid structure, a hierarchy, mm -hmm. and align the business model with the operations and then figure out how to uh, properly engage people to be proper managers, to be engaged with people. And that was something that I was mentioning to you, uh, you know, prior to start rolling here was, um, you know, just how people treat each other today. That's true, that's you true. Know? Do you speak the language? Do you speak Japanese? I do speak Japanese, yeah. Okay. So well, you studied while you were here? Or I studied or? while I was here. Okay. Something you were saying, Sal, that was interesting to me was about when they let you go, how you felt very resilient and you didn't think it was a problem. And since you've been in the situation so long, being in contract, right. mm -hmm. the thing that impressed me is when I was over this club and they had the Lehman shock, mm -hmm. I was surprised how many of those guys, that's the only job they ever had. Yeah. They never, straight out of college. Right. They did not know what to do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I um, a lot of people uh, suggest to me that I should be like a life coach and help yeah, people. That's what I was going to say. So you know. bring us up to where you are, but to go through mm -hmm. the other ones too. Sure, I want to hear where sure. you are now because mm -hmm. I heard, every time I see you, I always think about how your personality is always calm. Mm -hmm. You're always positive, regardless of what you're going. And when you mm -hmm. tell, when you told me one time mm -hmm. what you're going through in the background, I said, "Sheesh, yeah. I hope I can be that reserved." Yeah. And be going through something like mm -hmm. that. So basically, um, you know, I jumped around a bit from there. I went to work for a couple of MLM companies, network marketing business companies, um, and and those were great experiences for me. And both companies that I worked for, um, they, they're very exciting companies, you know, because they're they're marketing based, you know. And but it, it kind of gets you almost like to feel like you're a rock star, you know. I mean, you know, even though I was, um, you know, the CIO um, at, at one of these companies and in, in over the IT department and things like this. Um, you know, I got to travel because the, um, all the kind of executive level people, um, all of the distributors wanted to meet you and, you know, um, gain this uh, interaction to, to a bit of personal kind of connection there. Um, and so that you could get uh, from them as well. I always looked at it as an opportunity to be able to help them, you know. And, and I go through that, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a person from helping from way back. I mean, even if I back it up a, a little bit. You know, I was a firefighter. I worked as an EMT in the U.S. before I came into the military as well. well how old were you when um, you came in the military? I was 21. Okay, that's yeah. kind of late. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Those guys in their teens yeah. when they come in. Um, and so I've always been doing something that's helping, saving, or whatever. And so that's kind of always been my thing. Um, in sports as well, I'll get into that on a different level, mm -hmm. but um, as we go through. But um, so coming back to you know the MLM business and, and things like this. Um, those were the businesses actually I did um, longer stints with. Um, I was there for you know three years at each location, at each place, and um, I, I had a great time. You know, I got to learn and kind of establish myself. And I think that's the biggest challenge. And going back to what you were saying earlier about these people only in one job their whole life, you know, for me, I've jumped around so much. Like I said, um, the biggest thing for me is kind of a desire to really establish myself, to really get that sense of self. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, building yourself up, you join a company, it takes a year for you to feel comfortable in your environment, to feel confident in what you're doing and, and, 
and be able to uh, engage pe when, when someone engages you and says, hey, what's going on with this? You have the experience and knowledge now that you need to be able to respond to that. Mm -hmm. But you know, it, for, through that first year, you're just in chaos mode, mm -hmm. right? And it's just management, managing chaos. Mm -hmm. So I went through uh, a number of, you know, uh, when I say the, the MLM businesses mm -hmm. and a couple of contracts in between, but it's been like a three year that three years of you know full time employment, then um, let go the company downsized mm -hmm. and you know went through that process went from you know fifty to five people or whatever. I was at uh, Thomson Reuters for a while. Um, that was a little over two years. I guess I was with them, but that was contract as well. It was program management based. Um, it really enjoyed working there as well. Now I'm working with a kind of a tight group of people. Um, we have kind of created a, a business that we're all working with or for, but we're doing contract work where we can get it. a lot of it's security. Um, some of my area is more like in, internal controls. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say internal controls, um, where there's a, uh, an acronym called RBAC, which is Role-Based Access Control. Mm -hmm. So um, really bridging the gap between the understanding of how IT mm -hmm. and the business kind of integrate because um, most businesses think they don't don't understand or they don't think they need IT at the level that we, you know we try to suggest. You're not working with a you do contract based type business yeah. right now. I'm so a lot of people yeah. never been in that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. So they don't know and right. they feel out there and they feel puzzled like yeah. nobody you know they yeah. they don't have the the Merrill Lynch or anyone to yeah. come to them anymore. Right. So what do, you, what do you tell them? How do you tell them to get around that? Because you actually do have yeah. skills. Right. What do you tell these other guys? I just tell people the way it is. You, you yeah. should, yeah. Just you know, tell them straight up. Right. And um, I end up on the phone, I'd say, in, in heavy times, I've been on the phone daily with multiple recruiters through weeks and months at a time. What are, what are some of the biggest bigger differences with the young people now? Mm -hmm. We say young, we're talking like 20 to 35 or something like that. Right, right. What's, what's happening with them in your mind? Well, I think, um, you know, I would look at it as um, in terms of young people today don't realize how much of actual culture that we understand and that young people understand today as well actually comes not from today, but from previous right, generations. Of course. Yes. Okay. And you, you look at, at movies and the creation of people, the people who actually thought up all of these things. Um, so you, if you look at music and movies, I would say probably at least, maybe it's more than half, but there are so, there's so much music and so many movies that have been remade. Of course. Okay? Yes. And, you know, so there's, of course, you know, copyright infringements, all these other things, but people don't know that this is out there. That's right, right, you know? right. And know. I was talking to somebody about, um, the, you know, The Last of the Mohegans. And, and this is a movie that everybody refers back to. It was a 1992 movie with uh, Daniel Day-Lewis in it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the first make of that was 1926, right? And even I didn't know that, because I knew of one that was back in the 40s or 50s. Right. It was a, the, you know, and that was kind of the first one, but I didn't know there was one before that. So, so for me, what concerns me about you know, the generation today and or where we're going with mm -hmm. this is what, you know, what we um, you know, brought up in terms of this discussion is, is that um, we've lot of, lost a lot of personability, um, that, that personal interaction and the respect that goes with it. Mm -hmm. okay? So you know, when you wrote a letter, um, you always started off with dear so-and-so, okay? um, or Mr. So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so, oh, so all of these right. things. Um, now it's just hi, hey, or, hey, or yeah. whatever. Or just and straight into the Straight sense. into this, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. as if you know who it's coming from, so yeah. why don't you just yeah. answer this? Right. And you know, no there's politeness, no, no politeness, no hey, how you doing? Right. What you know, how, you how are things? Last time we spoke, right. this happened, that happened. So right. there's there's a, a process of engagement. I mean, it, it's huge, right? And taking that away um, from humanity is going to create a whole different type of humanity, know, yes, yes. right? And so, you know, and I try to to keep that with me, you know, in terms of my lifestyle. Um, and and, I, and like I tell you before about my grandchildren, my grandchildren have, have also helped me because when I see them, you know, because, you know, there's this, this unconditional love, of course, that is even different between parents to children and grandparents to children. Because it's not your responsibility. Yeah. And, 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 and you know. <laughs> and you don't, just, they, yeah. you don't care if they end up being like you. You just care <laughs> if they love you. Yeah. you. You know, I fear that that's that, that 
sense of engagement is just changing. Um, and it's quite disrespectful, you know. Yeah. That, that, it you feels know. that way to us because that's what yeah. we're used. What would you like to leave people with? Um, I'd okay. like to um, a little bit elaborate on, okay. on the last part we'll about you know, the motivation and stuff. So okay. if, if you went back to my, um, some of my videos I did for the, um, uh, the push-up challenges. Okay. Yeah, maybe I thought, so, wait, what you should do is send some of, can you send yeah, them? Oh, yeah, or I can yeah. Get they're them. all up on Facebook, but I'll send you the links to them. Some of the push-ups things, so yeah. what I'll do, that, that'll mm -hmm. be up, and I'll yeah. throw what you've done. Um, you did so that, that I did the push-up challenge three times. Okay. Um, yeah, it was like 2016, 18, and 19, or 20, I did. You did 20. Three, three, it was 20, three last year was 20. So, they, because the, the push-up challenges were based, originally it was 25. Okay. And that, that's based on the number of actual um, uh, service member suicides per day. It was 25 service members per day were committing suicide. That number then dropped down to 22. And then it went down to, I think it was 17 was the last time we did it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I was nominated um, all three times to join in on this. So I had you know, 25 days, 22 days, 17 days, and all these things. And so, you know, I did my, my uh, push-ups Marine Corps style, right. which are four, so four count exercise, right. right, which basically doubles whatever you're doing. So if you're doing 10, it equals 20. Right. Um, anyway, through those, um, the, this most recent one um, was obviously on the same subject about, you know, suicide and other things. And we were right in the midst of, of you know, coming up on the pandemic when I was doing it. It was right, basically, I mean, it was kind of out there, but it wasn't officially announced and or you know, put into a controlled situation. Um, but, you know, I, I looked at suicide. I had lost a friend here to suicide uh, a couple of years back. Um, close friend, he's also a Marine. And he, uh, we were, um, you know, fellow cyclists and, and rode together quite a bit. And it was a, a, a big surprise to me. And he was a couple of years older than me, but just never expected it. Um, we can talk about it offline, but I'll, right. uh, you know, was I'll he a member here? Was. No, he wasn't a member here. Okay. Um, so anyway, um, with that, you know, I, I um, lead into a few things around, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I think everybody's gone through it. But like when I was very young, um, I went through the, the, you know, the contemplation around suicide. Um, you know, do I want to live or, or not? What know? age was that? Um, around 15, I think. Oh, I was. so you were at home. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I was, a, you know, I was one of the... Um, uh, well, guinea pigs, poster child, or whatever for for ADHD, okay. right? And so I, I took every drug known to the oh public goodness. at that time. Hey, try this, try this, try this, you know. And so going through that, I was out of control, you know, and things like that. And um, uh, but from that, knowing that and everything else, but I had taken it into a different light. And one of the reasons why I got heavy into psychology was because I wanted to know about myself. And I spent, I spent many years as a, psych, as a psychiatrist, so I picked up a lot of uh, understanding of things from them, and it ended up being like my session with him, you know. And <laughs> but uh, so going through that, you know, and then, and then going into these, um, uh, you know, push-up challenges, you know, in, in the times we're at today, a lot of people don't know how to live with themselves. And, and, and I, I tell people, if you are going to, um, you know, a couple of different analogies, so if you're going to invite somebody to your house, if you're going to have a house party, what do you got to do to your house? You got to clean it up, right? If if I'm going to invite you into a conversation, well, I got to be prepared to to be comfortable with speaking, right? If I'm not comfortable to speak, um, or afraid to speak, or I say things that are just wrong, it'll come out wrong. It'll it'll maybe uh, come, you go the wrong way, and you'll take it the wrong way, and then we get into a battle, right? And so um, you got to keep your own house clean. So I always looked at it as, you know, spend more time with yourself, figure out who you are, and then find those areas that you can be comfortable in. And you find your comfort zone, and then when you have places, you know, things that impact you that are uncomfortable, because there's out, so much outside noise, you have to learn to deal with it. You have to learn how to turn it off or make it just flow through you like some type of conduit, right? And if you don't know how to do that, then, Getting a job. When you do get into a job, you won't function properly. You'll stress out. You go into one of these situations where you have to go on disability and all this other stuff. You you um, you become problem for other people, and and that's one of the things that I found so many people don't know how to do is do things for themselves, mm -hmm. and they're so dependent on other people, and that dependency is a weakness that is very very apparent, um, and. 
if you're in the work environment and you can't do your own job, you're just a problem. And if you're a manipulator, which you end up being a sociopath, <laughs> and sociopaths are not, you know, they're, they're everywhere and they're not fun to be around. Right. And if you're a good person and you have mm -hmm. compassion for other people, you, you'll feel bad for them. And you'll actually try to help them. For me, I, I like to help people. I mean, I still, I, I get people all the time. I'm walking down the street with somebody and I stop to, in the train station. I go hiking, whatever. There's some girl in heels carrying this giant you know, you piece home. of luggage. I grab it and run it down or up the next flight of stairs for her or do whatever. And she's looking at me like, you know. Yeah, thinking you know. you, she probably thinks you're taking it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Here in Japan, she yeah. thinks you're taking it. So, but so with that, what I'm looking at is, you know, and what I said in my push-up challenge stuff as well is, is look, work on yourself. Um, look at your lifestyle and try to figure out some of the things that are normalcy, the normalcy of life. Right? We all have what's called simplicity, right? And it's different for different people, different cultures, different upbringings. But there's a baseline that everybody has. And if you can pull yourself back to that baseline and then work to establish a comfort zone for yourself so that you feel confident and comfortable, that if somebody walked into my house right now and you looked at it, people think, is this a hotel room? You live in a hotel? No, it's clean because I like to keep it clean. Um, not, not to say that it can't get messy. It's I'm not saying, dirty. I'm saying, I'm right? saying. So I'll let it get messy, but I typically I just I clean it all up. So I focused on myself. Learn to be, um, you know, to gain composure for myself, to feel comfortable and confident with myself. Now, I still have my insecurities, but, you know, that's, that's natural, I think. You can't be 100%. But I'm at a, in a zone. So those of you that are out there, especially during the pandemic, you know, um, take a look in the mirror. Start to really start to talk to yourself. Not out loud, hopefully, because then you look strange out in public talking to yourself. You know, at least put an earphone in so it looks like you're talking to somebody else. But um, build on that and then find things that you can excel on and try to balance you as a person and then look at other people. And before you judge someone else, think about yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Just, you know, it's easy to judge other people. But That's true. you're not living in their shoes, you're living in yours. And if you want to judge somebody, think about how you're living first before you judge somebody else. You don't know what they're going through. Take compassion right. Right, and passion and put it together yeah. and, and build it into a, a living lifestyle. Wow. Yeah. Sal, thank you so much. Listen, yeah. if people want to contact you, how would they do about doing that? Facebook um, or what? I, I'm online, I'm on Facebook, I'm uh, oh, Instagram. Cool. 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 Um, so, I mean, my Facebook is just my first and last name, all one word, Salvatore Salvino. Okay. Right? So, no no okay. dot, no nothing, right. just all one word. It'll be on this podcast And sure. um, you can find me there. Um, Instagram. I don't actually know what my name on Instagram no, is. But after they contact still, you through that, yeah. they'll get you. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Thank you for doing this. I no, really no, appreciate it. It makes me really, really yeah. happy to have you. It was a lot of fun. I seen a lot of time. Yes. A lot of fun. Thank you for watching this podcast. It's been a pleasure talking with Sal. Make sure you touch the subscribe button and also like. Remember that it's all on loan. Continue to reach for the stars. Thank you.